Voting for Kamala is just voting for a continuation of the existing hostile policy towards the industry. It's capitalism under a Bitcoin standard or it's communism under a central bank digital currency. You have one side who's pro Bitcoin. They've made it a part of their official party platform. And I'm talking about RFK Jr. And I'm talking about Donald Trump as someone who cares about the industry in the United States. Yeah, I hope Trump wins Bitcoin over party, not party over Bitcoin. The fact that you're putting a fiat political party over Bitcoin is naive. Once the Bitcoin industry thrives, fix the money, fix the world, baby. Imagine the thing that you're saving in is consistently losing value every single day. You're putting all your energy and your time and your work into earning effing paper. They've psyoped everyone into believing that somehow money has to lose purchasing power to work. The reason that Bitcoin is so powerful is because it doesn't require democracy. You as an individual can start living on a sound money standard. And all of a sudden, even if the people around you just don't believe you, you're just like, all right, they don't believe me. Like my life is getting better. Every single person that is actively holding Bitcoin is now working for you. How do you see Bitcoin changing the relationship between governments and the citizens? Yeah, I think it I think it changes like fundamentally like how society organizes itself because before most people they've custodied their wealth with institutions and custodians and there's really only a handful of them and that makes it very easy for governments to not only seize those assets but also deputize those institutions or custodians. Uh, to enforce certain types of policy, whether that's reporting, whether that's like, you know, these these crazy life, for example, like in the United States, they passed the Bank Secrecy Act back in the 1970s. And part of the Bank Secrecy Act was that every $10,000 uh, transaction or more had to be reported to the government. What people forget, though, is that back in the 1970s, if you adjust for inflation, $10,000 is the equivalent of $80,000 worth of purchasing power today. So that number stayed the same. In fact, in the inflation reduction bill that they tried to pass, uh, they did pass, but this part didn't wasn't included in the bill. They tried to include, include a clause where every $600 transaction had to be reported, right? So as an American, this is against the Fourth Amendment, which is no unreasonable searches and seizures. Like, why do we live in a society where the government has to know every single transaction that's happening? And how is that somehow contributing to my safety? So it's very difficult for them. And you see them kind of missing with messing with the language a little bit. It's going to be very difficult for them to control uh, peer to peer transactions. And you're already seeing them react to uh, peer to peer information. Right. Like this is why they hate Twitter so much. Like this is why they hate social media so much. And they why they want to censor it was because before social media, like there was only a handful of custodians, there was only a handful of media outlets of which they can co-opt and they can control the narrative. Now, when you have millions upon millions of people like what we're doing right now, talking directly, it becomes very difficult to psyop the population into believing a single narrative. And now all of a sudden people start to ask very difficult questions and they don't have really good responses to that. So their knee jerk reaction is like, we have to censor more. This is a danger to democracy. It's like, how is conversation a danger to democracy? Like what, what is going on there? So um, a lot of things are happening. I would say really the way that I phrase it is the great disintermediation. The internet started the fire. Information came first. And money is now happening. We're starting to seep into that. And it's just going to empower the individual, the likes of which human history has never seen before. The fact that you can memorize 12 to 24 words and you can take millions, billions, trillions of dollars with you, you can memorize it, even though I don't suggest that, is incredibly powerful. And I think that's going to shift the balance of power from the state back to the individual. And I don't think we've ever lived in that type of society before, but I'm extremely excited for it.
Do you think the nation states will become more service based as uh, the individual gets empowered and they don't have real power over them? I think that's the theory, right? That's like that's what we believe from the sovereign. Like if you read the sovereign individual, which I'm I'm absolutely certain that you have, and most Bitcoiners have, uh, that's the theory, right? As there's more competition between different jurisdictions, um, it it becomes kind of like a soft forcing function onto them where they now have to compete for citizens because if not, the citizens just get up and leave and take all their wealth with them. However, I think they're not just going to, that model isn't just going to go gently into that good night. And what I'm seeing now lately, and I've really noticed this trend over the last six months, and I just kind of been having these thoughts and there's really two models in front of us. Um, one of the things that I always say is Bitcoin or slavery. A lot of people interpret it as this hyperbolic statement. It's really not. And when I mean slavery, like we have two economic models that we're, 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 we're steamrolling ahead to. And they're very uncomfortable for a lot of Bitcoiners. Bitcoiners are like, I don't want to talk about politics, but I think it's incredibly important to talk about. It's, it's capitalism under a Bitcoin standard or it's communism under a central bank digital currency. Those are the like that is where the world is heading. Do we want to live in China or do we want to live in a free kind of market society? I don't believe there's going to be an in between. And I think as time progresses, that's going to become more and more and more obvious. So just having this utopian view of like, no, Bitcoin's going to fix everything and everything's going to be fine. I think people underestimate the tumultuous times that are ahead of us in order for us to live in the world that we want to live in, or we're just all going to have to move to El Salvador, right? But I bet you that if there's enough countries that are under a CBDC standard, they'll see El Salvador as a threat. So you want multiple countries that are pro-Bitcoin and are pushing and are, are pro-Bitcoin, are pro-business, pro-free market, pro uh, private property, you want more countries following the, the, those footsteps. You don't want more countries following in the footsteps of China. And as time progresses, it seems like a lot of countries are looking at China and at least their politicians, maybe not their citizens, but their politicians are looking over and they're saying, you know what? That looks like a pretty good idea. We should bring that over here, you know? So I think that's what's at stake, but it's on to us. Like our destiny is in our hands. Like don't ask what you can do for Bitcoin. Ask what, don't ask what Bitcoin could do for you. Ask what you can do for Bitcoin. And that's amazing because um, we discussed it a little bit before and then I really want to get into this topic with you as we Bitcoin tend to say like, oh, Bitcoin doesn't care. Bitcoin will do it anyways. And to a certain extent, it's it's true, but not to the full extent. As when we come to this topic, we are like, you you are a physical person. You are in a, in a country and uh, maybe they cannot do anything to Bitcoin directly, but it, they can do a lot to you. So politics matter for you personally. You have to kind of make a stand for you. And there's then also the, the thing like, oh, you can either flee to El Salvador, as you mentioned, but you can also stay and fight in your country for better policies, better things. And it's, it's a hard thing to do because when you're in Austria, it's, it's easier to fight. Like there's a lot more freedom going on uh, in Austria. But what if you are in North Korea or China? <laughs> then, then the conversation is a whole different one. Um, do you advocate for, for fighting in, in your country for, for better, um, stands to have it worldwide? Uh, and also in, in the question, when we have those roads that you painted, like the one road with CBDCs and the one road with Bitcoin, do you imagine that at some point the whole world will be on either one of that? Or could that be like, oh, like 40% of the world is there and 60% of the world is there? Could that be like, uh, there's a freedom world, but there's also a CBDC world? How do you see that? Yeah, I think, you know, it's a, the world's a big place. Um, so I think that there's always going to be corners of the earth that, you know, are either full on collectivist society and there's always going to be corners of the earth where, you know, there's going to be freedom. But that freedom maybe isn't because of the government, but maybe it's because of the lack of government there. Right. Um, but what I will say is like 
just just like let's take a look at history right so the you know the 20th century was essentially especially the later half of the 20th century was a fight between two opposing not only political ideologies but economic ideologies uh we thought in the 90s that it was it was over with the downfall of the ussr what we didn't realize is you know they they rebranded a lot of these collectivist ideologies um you know instead of it making a class struggle they made it about race uh they made it about sexuality and they kind of rebranded it a little bit and that seems to have been a little bit more successful in terms of picking up popularity in the west and what i will say as well is uh if you look at the rise of china right uh china what they realized is that they couldn't have a top down economy so they took a they essentially have a free market economy with like this kind of like fascistic government right but it's still communist government with branding but it's really kind of like a fascist fa- fascistic government and what i'm seeing in the west is a little bit troubling because it's like we're all kind of just like like you know moving toward that direction the canadian truckers protest is a great example of that right the people were just having a you know a political protest and they just started shutting down their bank accounts now what does all of this have to do with anything those types of totalitarian governments are only possible and this is the fifth tenet in the communist manifesto they're only possible when you have the centralization of credit meaning a central bank if you take away the central bank you take away the state's ability to effectively redistribute wealth so you can't have a collectivist society you can't have a society where politicians are basically promising their voters free things because the only way for a government to raise revenue under a bitcoin standard is via direct taxation you can only bring that up so high until people are just like you know what i don't care about the war in ukraine right the reason that they're able to get away with the funding is because they're able to get away with the indirect taxation of inflation so i don't think we've we've uh that that type of discourse has reached the mainstream yet but anyways to answer your question i think we're going to have like i think that this century is going to be very similar to the last century but instead of like these proxy kinetic wars i think it's going to be more information warfare uh more than anything like what type of information are you consuming uh you know what 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 do you know what do you not know because i truly believed i believe that the people that are in collectivist societies i think if, if they knew the full picture they wouldn't be okay with it i think the reason that they're okay with it is because they've been propagandized to believe what it is that the guy in the suit on tv with an emblem behind him is saying rather than what the truth actually is that's so interesting uh just at the thought in my mind when we have a uh, information warfare are then content creators and podcast hosts and all those things then the new soldiers of, of the new war absolutely i mean i've said this i said this at the i think it was bitcoin 2022 or 2023 i said it i said if memes are if uh if tweets are bullets memes are artillery in this narrative trench warfare that we're fighting on the battlegrounds of the internet you're absolutely a frontline soldier and you by making content what you're doing is you're leveraging the power of the internet to get this conversation out to as many voices with the hopes of waking people up and getting them on the side of team orange because a lot of people are are lost in the sauce when they say oh it's liberal versus conservative it's left versus right no 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 whatever government is power whether in power whether it's left or right they do the same thing they print money what the actual battle at hand is is the battle of team green team fiat team central bank digital currency team slavery team nihilism team war versus team orange which is team hope team prosperity team peace team opportunity right it's you know it's 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 like i don't want to say good or, or versus evil cuz it's kind of cliche but that's really the battle at hand and what's winning for us like why I believe we're going to win at the end is because their team 
is it requires coercion and co-opting of the narrative in order for it to be for it to be a, a for it to be a winning message. People don't once people like see I'll put it to you this way. Have you ever met someone who has transitioned to a Bitcoin standard that has come back to fiat and says, I miss fiat. Like, oh, I love the dollar. I love the euro. It was great. It was phenomenal. I love what the government is doing. No, it's a one way door. So their hope is to stop as many people as coming to Team Orange as they humanly can. And that's why you're starting to see all these attacks on self-custody. That's why you're seeing the arrest of privacy developers. That's why you're seeing lightning wallet companies exiting the US, right? That's what that's what's happening here. And by the way, one last point. This was all predicted. If you book if you read the book The Sovereign Individual, everything that's happening right now was predicted by that book and it was very very accurate. They didn't get everything right, but they got a lot of things right. It's it's so interesting when you look at some history books and the history um, things that happened and then predicted the future. Um, do we have to kind of like, let's come now to the US election and to, to, the, to the world right now. Um, you said in the beginning that you think that we now have to uh, pick and choose a side and we have to be uh, to a certain extent political and like really fight for, for our, our freedom. Um, how, how is that now Affect, uh, affecting the U.S. election? Yeah, so it, it's a couple things. So it's a very tough pill to swallow for some Bitcoiners because Bitcoiners are inherently anti-state and they've already lost faith in elections and they've already lost faith in the political system, rightly so. Um, and I And I empathize with that. But at the same time, you know, traditional fiat elections still have consequences. Right now you have, and I've been covering this for the last year or so, you have one side who's pro-Bitcoin, right? They've made it a part of their official party platform. Uh, and I'm talking about RFK Jr. And I'm talking about Donald Trump. It's part of the Republican Party platform. It says protect the right to self-custody, protect the right to mine, you know, fire Gary Gensler. Trump had the speech at the at the Bitcoin conference, RFK had the speech at the Bitcoin conference. And then on the other side, which is quite interesting because it's an election year and they obviously don't want Bitcoiners to vote against them. So they're kind of walking it back with their rhetoric and their wording and they're saying crypto for Keras and all that stuff. But if you actually take a look at their actions, you're talking about a proposed 30% tax on Bitcoin miners. You're talking about Operation Choke Point 2.0. You're talking about Caitlin Long's, the first fully reserved Bitcoin bank in the United States based out of Wyoming, denied a federal banking charter. She told me when she came on my podcast that that order came directly from the White House. The attack on self-custody, the arrest of, of open source developers, including the developer of Tornado Cash, and the tornado, the developers of of uh, of of Samurai, right? Selling, setting precedents, basically saying if you develop software, uh, you can go to prison. Uh, another thing, uh, the promise of RFK and Trump to free Ross Ulbrich, you know, but Kamala is basically saying like, I love Bitcoiners, but she can do that right now. She's part of the executive branch. What's stopping her, right? Um, so what else? Uh, you had the arrest of Roger Ver. You had the arrest of CZ. You had the essentially like it's Le uh, Arthur Hayes. And you could say, oh, no, those guys are CEOs of shitcoin casinos. They deserve it. It's like, OK, fine. You can say that. But we all have to remember what happened in 2008. 2008 financial crisis where Main Street bailed out Wall Street. No significant banker went to jail for the crimes that they committed. So we're playing by a different set of rules than the bureaucrats and the central bankers, right? So this election is essentially, do you want a pro-Bitcoin, anti-CBDC president in the White House? Or do you want a anti-Bitcoin, pro-CBDC president in the White House? 
and connect this with what I was saying earlier on in the show. What future do you want? Do you want a future of Bitcoin or do you want a future of slavery? And unfortunately, what a lot of Bitcoiners don't understand is that this election in the United States, it's going to have significant consequences, not for the death of Bitcoin. Bitcoin doesn't need a politician to survive. Bitcoin is anti-fragile. Politicians need Bitcoin to survive, not the other way around. So I just want to specify that. But for the regulatory environment and for the business environment and on it, and then frankly, like just for just if you're a Bitcoiner living in the United States, this election will have significant consequences on you as a business owner, as a Bitcoiner, as an entrepreneur, as someone who's running a lightning wallet. I mean, you've already seen this. You've seen Wallet of Satoshi. You've seen Phoenix Wallet. Could you believe that the United States of America that that literally advertises itself as the land of the free, home of the brave and the other countries where lightning wallets aren't available are North Korea and China and the United States is somehow on that list. Like that's insane. And that's due to the regulatory environment, which is coming from the current executive branch. So voting for Kamala is just voting for a continuation of the existing hostile policy towards the industry. And then voting for Trump or RFK is literally, they said it at the conference. Like, I will fire Gary Gensler. I will end the attack on on Bitcoin and the industry. You know, like, drill, baby, drill. Let's mine. Like, all this stuff. Like, all these good things that are pro-industry. That's what's on the line. And that's a very uncomfortable conversation for a lot of Bitcoiners because they hate politics. But my message to them is, you might hate politics. You might pretend politics isn't there. But politics sure does know you're there and it sure does care about you. Right. So, yeah, if look, we're serious about this being the world reserve currency. And I think a lot of Bitcoiners are. You got to ask yourself, like, eventually this was always going to happen. We had the advantage of being able to play in the shadows for the early years of Bitcoin's history. But if we're really serious about this becoming the world reserve currency, these types of political clashes were an inevitability. There were there. It was always going to happen. It was just a matter of when. Do Do you think? Uh, and I think you have more insights into American politics than me. Do you think that Trump and RFK have to join forces at some point? Because like it feels like RFK could uh, steal a lot of uh, votes from uh, Trump, and maybe that's like the deciding votes against <laughs> uh, then uh, having a Harris uh, presidency. Yeah. So. Um, there was actually a thing that came out today, um, where you had the VP of RFK's campaign basically say that she is deciding whether to bow out and support Donald Trump or, uh, you know, or, or stay in the race and fend to making a third party. Like, That's essentially what she's saying right now. Um, And and, you know, I think she sees the writing on the wall. I think so, too. I I think RFK is doing a great job and uh, would have a hard time deciding between those two uh, because uh, like RFK feels uh, as the better choice. But then there's also this strategic thinking of of avoiding a Harris uh, thing. So like that's that's interesting. it was said on a podcast. So like she's literally said this today on a podcast, like it, the clip is, has been making rounds on Twitter where it's, she's basically, and this is the VP of the RFK campaign where she's basically like, look, like we either run as a third party and we try to get 5% of the vote or we throw in the towel and endorse Trump, you know? So like I, I personally, as someone who I, and again, I, I hate the whole liberal conservative right versus blue thing. But as someone who cares about the industry in the United States as a Bitcoin entrepreneur in the United States, like, yeah, I hope Trump wins, you know, and again, what I just said is very inflammatory to a lot of people. And what the messaging that I kept saying is like, guys, Bitcoin over party, not party over Bitcoin. Like the fact that you're putting a fiat political party over Bitcoin, Bitcoin fixes these things. 
is naive. Like Bitcoin fixes a lot of the the issues that society is currently enduring. And those in- issues fundamentally stem from broken money. Broken money is, okay, the quality of food, the quality of products, the fact that people can't afford housing, the fact that people can't afford for the future, this nihilistic mindset, this depression, short-term thinking. The, most of the world is operating under that, that software, right? Bitcoiners, think about it. It's like, like life is awesome. I, it, things just get cheaper over time. I just get wealthier. This is great. This is phenomenal, right? So like if you're voting against Trump, you're essentially like voting for more of the same bullshit that we've endured over these many, many years, not because of Trump's policies on the border or immigration or any of the, you know, the, I, I don't even want to say it, like the, all the, you know, all the things that you hear all the time on the news, like, oh, you know, board, all this is such garbage. I don't care. Like, do what you want. Like, none of that matters. What matters is, is that you have the president of the most powerful country in the world creating a positive environment for the Bitcoin industry to thrive. Once the Bitcoin industry thrives, Fix the money, fix the world, baby. That's the way that I'm seeing it. And that's the way that I see it as a single issue voter. And I hope people wake up to that reality, to that fact. I love that a lot. That 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 was just an amazing thing. Um, m- maybe let's do uh, one thing now. What what happens if this, this thing does not work out and the, the CDBC route uh, wins? What if like people are too... Uh, convenience to actually do the self custody. Uh, all Bitcoin are centralized on, on exchanges and ETFs and all those things. The war on privacy and the war on on, on peer to peer was successful. Would um, would that mean that if CBDCs wins, uh, if centralization wins, if uh, no privacy wins, and all those things, would that mean that Bitcoin breaks and was unsuccessful? Is that even a, in a route that we could go? Towards? No, no. I, I think even in the US, like even if Kamala wins, like, you know, the uh, one of the things that I'm a first generation American. So I, I, I migrated to the com- to the country from Venezuela. Right. And one of the things that's awesome about the United States and it always makes it very difficult for totalitarian governments to completely a central totalitarian government to completely dictate the rest of the country is for three reasons. Reason number one is freedom of speech, right? So our ability to speak freely is protected. The government is not supposed to censor you. Uh, They try to do it through private companies, but they can't do it directly themselves. If you have open discourse and you you can't shut down ideas, you're forced to debate them. That's number one. Number two, my personal favorite, is the Second Amendment. So the right to bear arms. Uh, The United States is the most heavily armed country on the face of the planet. The citizens have a lot of guns, meaning if the government ever tries to come up with something that is like so insane, they're going to question it because they're going to fear for their own lives. Right. They're going to be like, okay, maybe it's not a good idea to go door to door and try to confiscate people's wealth. That guy might have two AR-15s like maybe let's leave that alone. Right. That's number two. Number three is the federal system. So each individual state works kind of like its own separate country with its own separate laws. And that's only going to accelerate because one of the things that keeps a lot of these countries together, even though they don't have a lot of things in common, is the money, right? So like the money kind of functions as this glue but what starts to happen if if a state starts to put Bitcoin on its treasury? What happens if a state says, OK, you know, the state of Texas is making Bitcoin legal tender. The federal government say, no, 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 you can't do that. That's already happened before. Where has that happened? That has happened in the marijuana industry. So marijuana is illegal on a federal level in the United States. Multiple states, including California, Colorado, Washington, just to name a few, there's many more basically said, no, marijuana is legal. This is fine. So the federal government is is stuck in a predicament where 
it's still illegal on a federal level, but the states are allowing the industries to thrive. I think if Bitcoin has trouble on the federal level, it's going to continue to succeed on the state level. And also shout out to Dennis Porter because he's done a pretty good job on this. And essentially he's he's pushed forward on in many different states, making it uh, making the right to self custody and the right to mine protected by the states. Right. So even if oh, and this and I forgot to mention this, the state of Florida passed a law specifically banning central bank digital currencies. Right. So that's the, one of the beautiful things about the U.S. is that the states act on their own and therefore it creates competition. Like when New York and California started going down the totalitarian COVID shutdown r- rules, a lot of people just left and went to California and Florida where they didn't have those rules. So uh, fundamentally, it's going to be very, very difficult for this like, you know, full fascist totalitarian government all over the world. But that's not to say that you don't want to stand and fight. Like, I love my country. I love what it represents. I, you know, maybe I don't well, like, I, and I could, and I, and I speak Spanish. I can move to El Salvador. That's fine. But what if I don't want to move? What if my family is there? What if I just don't want to move? What if, what if I want to stand my ground? You know, if things get horrible, I'll leave. That's fine. But I don't want to leave. Like, what happened in Venezuela was a tragedy, you know, like uh, 20 years of socialism and the country completely destroyed and 8 million Venezuela. This is a country of 29 million people, like a third. Do you understand how many people that is it's left? They just left, you know, and these are the smartest people. These are the most capable people. These are the business owners. These are the people that have the means. And there was a giant brain drain. So I don't want that to happen in the U.S., you know, so I think it's worth it to fight until you can't fight anymore, in my opinion. And when I mean fight, I mean like information warfare. I don't mean like go and, you know, do stupid shit, you know, and, you know, like talk and try to convince people of your point of view. Wait, in in Venezuela, nine million people left? Yeah, yeah. It's like it's it's insane. It's more than Austria. (laughs) Yeah, no, it, it the amount of people like I'll 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 double check the exact figure, but yes, it was millions and millions of people and it's a country of 29 million people. Oh, that's 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 crazy. That's really crazy. It's also interesting for me when I look at the states uh, because there's also the European Union uh which basically is uh, a union not as the states uh but it's countries and they also have money like we use the euro so it's a little bit uh comparable and i see it more and more failing the eu and uh failing in a in a in a strong way we have the eu election not that long ago and basically all the parties that were critical about the eu were getting way stronger uh than they were before so so the Overall consensus is, oh yeah, we are very critical what the EU is doing. And it's a very likely chance that in like the next 50 years, the EU is not uh, there anymore in the, in the form that it is now there. Do you think that's also a possibility in the USA that uh, the states actually become their own countries again, where there is no real federal government maybe there's like some trade deals between those and, and some overall thing but uh what if the u.s dollar uh collapses away then what what's binding the states together yeah and that's an excellent question and i just asked chat gbt real quick so yes it, it's 7.7 million people in a country of 28 million that's a third that's almost a third right that's wow. insane right that's insane yeah so um, just to be accurate with the figures. Um, now, in regards to your question, I think that's an excellent question. I, I think the U.S. is just going to be regressing to how the country was before the establishment of the Federal Reserve in 1913. So I think the U.S., like, it's in the name. The United States of America it doesn't say it's one big country. It's just a bunch of states. So I think it's perfect. Like, it goes hand in hand. I think people have this weird conceptual version of what the role of government should be in people's lives. And I think that they've had like 
it's 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 been misrepresented and 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 uh like it, it, it's been a, it's it's been misrepresented and abused and the reason that politicians have been able to convince so many people of the government can fix your problems even though they never do is the money printer the, the fact that politics that is the, I, I would say that is one of the most dangerous things humanity has ever seen politicians with the power of an unlimited money supply so endless wars programs things that would never stand up on their own economically because they would just run out of money continue to just get funded and funded and funded and funded and funded and it creates all these inefficiencies so i think that if you don't have a money that is you know uh connecting the entire country i i i, I don't see the united states the way that the federal government is structured today continuing and back to the European Union, you guys have it a little bit worse. Like Brussels is like, holy sh! Like, god damn, man, they're going full. Like, it, it's so funny because they tried to promote, and we've been covering this. Uh, they've been trying to promote the CBDC. It wasn't very popular. They changed the name. Now it's just called the digital euro, which is exactly the same thing. They just dropped the CBDC because they realized how unpopular it was, but the amount of power that the bureaucrats in Brussels have is in, they don't care. Like they ask the people, they release the poll. Do you believe that we need a CBDC? The vast majority of people are like, no, they're like Christine Lagarde. It's like, we're moving forward with a democratic process of the CBDC. And I'm like, holy shit. And then uh, the Ursula, the Ursula lady comes out and she's like, Twitter is a threat to democracy and we are going to pass these laws in order to set like, and I'm like, so, and then there was this letter that came out out of the European Union from a, a EU bureaucrat warning Elon about the Twitter spaces that he was going to have with Trump. And if you just break down that to like the basics, right? Just like the very basics of it. So you're telling me that a European politician is telling an American, an American company, that he can or he cannot have a conversation with a potential future president. What the f, f is going on? That's insane. That's crazy. I remember when Tucker had the interview with Putin, right? They lost their minds. And this is what I was talking about, like earlier in the very beginning of the show, when I said, like, we are living in this like very pivotal moment in human history where all these power structures are being disintermediated by the internet. So it's like before the politician in the EU would have to call what, what's a very popular newspaper in Europe. I don't know. Uh, I only have Austrian newspapers, but I don't read them. There's their standard. Uh, it's a popular one, but I, I don't know if there's like European ones, actually it's more like country wise. So, so like the guardian, for example, like let's, let's talk about the, the UK ones, right? Like the guardian and financial times. They would call them and say, hey, don't run that story. And the newspapers would say, okay. I saw this very popular quote. It was so popular. It said, if social media existed back in 2003, the war in Iraq would have never happened. Because it was the New York Times that released a story that Saddam had weapons of mass destruction. It came out about half half a decade later that it was actually the u.s intelligence agencies that were telling the new york times that iraq had weapons of mass destruction so that they can convince the american people that it would be okay to invade iraq those manipulation mechanisms are no longer there you're living it right now the fact that we're having this conversation and you can post it directly to your audience look at all the things that we're saying that wouldn't be acceptable to a lot of people like this is what i mean and as more and more of the world wakes up to this like new information medium i think we're going to see more and more freedom and it's going to be very difficult for these top-down bureaucratic heavy societies in order to for them to convince society that somehow they're benefiting you like my question to you is as, as a european like 
Is Brussels helping you? <laughs> If you watch or listen to my podcast on a regular basis, I guess you already bought some Bitcoin. And now the most important step is to keep the Bitcoin. Keep them secure in a hardware wallet. My personal recommendation for hardware wallet is the Bitbox. It's super secure. It's simple to set up. It's also a perfect gift for a friend who has still the Bitcoin on an exchange. And you can get a 5% discount with the code Robin at the checkout. Visit bitbox.swiss slash Robin to get your Bitbox. And if you really want to bulletproof your self-custody setup, your security setup, and maybe even your citizenship set up you have to talk to the bitcoin way if you go to the bitcoinway.com slash partners slash robin you get a 30 minute free call where you can dive deep with them if your self-custody setup is secure if your citizenship is secure or maybe might be improvable or your digital footprint in general is secure they are the experts in cybersecurity, in bitcoin self-custody and how to be a secure sovereign individual in general and last but not least i have something completely new for you guys i partnered up with coin vigilante this is the most beautiful bitcoin timepiece that i ever saw created by anyone look at that beauty i love it so much coin vigilante made a perfect bitcoin watch that's the perfect subtle elegant way to go out there and show that you are a bitcoiner and that watch brand is bitcoin Bitcoin only. Make sure to check out the link in the description for this amazing coin vigilante timepieces. Those watches are amazing. I love them so much. It was really hard for me to pick the one that I want to have because there are a lot of great options. I went with the new transparency edition. They are all limited. So grab yours. Those will not be available for a long time, but there will come new models and new amazing designs along the way. I'm very envy of the States, actually. Like every time I speak with Americans and they're like, oh, I, I don't like the government. I'm like, hey, you, you have the better one. <laughs> you have the way better one. Because in the European election, there was not even a word of Bitcoin. Like this was not even a topic, uh, like an official topic that was actually discussed by, by the leading candidates, not on a nation level and not on a on a European level. And this was just like really sad to see. And then the same time I see states doing it. Then I see an American, uh, I see the United States saying like, oh, we will ban CBDCs. We will not let that happen in the States. Uh, European is like going forward with it and really wanting it. And I'm like, okay, there is in Austria directly next to me, Switzerland, which is basically Austria just without the European Union uh, from the landscape and stuff like that. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm ready if, if the European Union uh, is, is doing too much uh, and uh, if Austria does not do something against it, like for Austrians, it's very uh, easy and convenient to go to, to Switzerland. And even if like Switzerland, I have uh, a lot of hopes, like also a lot of Bitcoiners are actually moving there. Lugano, uh, you're also going there, uh, you told me. Um, Lugano is a big place. So like, I think uh europe is a really beautiful uh continent like so many beautiful and stunning places uh i i would hate to leave that uh, continent but if i have to uh, at some point uh like with venezuela you said like so many people left and those were the business owners those were the uh, thought leaders that left and not the the, the bottom uh, so yeah it's a it's a sad state of of the european union uh and i hope Uh, we can turn this around uh, or just do it on a nation level. Why do we need the European Union? Yes, we can have like trade agreements. We can have all the things that we have uh, borders are better uh, organized that you don't have to have like a, 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 a visa or something like that if you want to go to the Germany. So that's great. There are like good things about the European Union. Uh, as, as a European citizen, you can literally go a long way without uh, any... Uh, any um, um, obstacle there, but there are really bad things about the European Union uh, also. And I'm envy of the United States, to be honest. Like, I'm really envy. I would love for Bitcoin to be a topic in Austria in, in the European Union, but it is not. <laughs> so I'm envy of you. Yeah, I mean, but th this is why this is why I kept saying, like, this is this is why we fight. Like, this is why this is what you're doing right now. Um, 
like you you just started this and you know you're a pretty young guy but one of the things that i've realized making media um you know i started simply i was 27 years old right and a lot of the things that i kept like i kept and I had no experience in media, no experience in podcasting, nothing. I was like, oh, I like, I want to do a podcast. One of the things that I kept realizing and is that like we are at the front line of this. Like we are the soldiers. We are the evangelists. If it's not us, it's not going to be anybody else. Like, and this is where, you know, like some of the founding fathers in the United States, they were men in their late 20s early thirties, somewhere in their mid thirties, somewhere in their thirties, somewhere in their late thirties. But the, the whole point is that they were pretty young men and they were thinking of a revolution. What is this, but not a revolution? Like this is the separation of money and state. The Europe went through a very kind of pivotal moment in its history. I would say it's like the era of the enlightenment, the separation of, of, of church and state, you know, the French revolution, horrific, <laughs> Um, you know, but there was two ways, like look at how the U S had its revolution and look at how the French had its revolution. So like the point is though, is that now all of a sudden the church doesn't play as, as, as big of a role in society, but before, you know, the French revolution, before a lot of these revolutions happen, like even the one in Russia, the church played like a, a huge role in society. So we are entering this phase and it falls on to our generation and it's a very different type of warfare right before a lot of people just picked up a bunch of guns and they're like all right let's storm the castle get the king you know yeah chop his chop his head off like you know like th that that's what people conceive in their minds as what a revolution is in the era of the internet when we're all interconnected and we can have conversations thousands of miles away from each other instantaneously this is warfare this is warfare like the other side is going to try to throw shit at you they're going to tell you cbdc's are good christine lagarde's going to come out here and she's like for the sovereignty of europe uh, we need a cbdc or or the financial stability of the whole content is at risk like it's like no you're fucking lying your money is the one that's causing financial instability. So that's what I mean is that like we essentially have to speak out and make our voices heard louder than theirs. And we're winning. We're winning so hard. Look, look at how they react to it. You know what's the most popular downloaded news app application right now in the world? It's X. It's not CNN. It's not New York Times. It's not The Guardian. It's not all the official media sources. It's people breaking the news, right? So we need more of that. And the more we get of that, the more our movement wins because Bitcoin is truth and fiat is a lie. And because it's based on a lie, not only is it a lie, it's based on a lie and it's based on theft. Because it's based on theft and because it's based on a lie, it needs coercion manipulation and narrative control in order to function without those things the truth will win every single time look bitcoin is going to win because of its incentives when the ccp banned bitcoin mining within its borders the hash rate dropped 50 percent, taking the price down with it right this was the 2021 cycle without any central authority ceo nothing nobody the hash rate recovered on its own. Why? Bitcoin's incentives. Bitcoin has co-opted the human race and human greed in order to ensure its survival. And what it's given humanity in return is prosperity and peace. And it changes humanity's operating system where instead of everyone fighting tooth and nail to get to the top of the fiat system, we now live in a system of aligned incentives. So all of a sudden, Michael Saylor works for you if you're holding Bitcoin. El Salvador works for you. Max Kaiser works for you. Larry Fink now works for you. Your incentives are now aligned with their incentives. So these 
what Larry Fink, you see BlackRock, you would see you'd perceive it as this evil institution. It's not necessarily that it was evil. It was playing the games of fiat and the games of fiat are evil. The games of fiat are zero sum where it winner takes all. The games of Bitcoin is everyone could win. Everyone is equal. If you want to buy Bitcoin or earn Bitcoin, you have to get in line and buy spot Bitcoin like everyone else. You can't manipulate the rules to benefit yourself like fiat. So it's a much fairer system. And that's what we're fighting for. And that, and to answer your question, because I've been on a rant, <laughs> rant um, that's why I believe fundamentally these large bureaucracies like the European Union or like the United States federal government, I think if enough people wake up and they'll start to say like, why am I paying 39% of my income for what exactly? You know, oh, and there's inflation. What am I getting in return for this? I have no idea, right? So I think we're heading in that direction, but I think it's going to be very bumpy uh, on the way there. Yeah, and I mean, uh, in in you can even make an argument that inflation rate, uh, tax, your tax rate is like eighty percent of uh, or more even when you factor in inflation. When you factor in, there's taxes also on the goods that you buy with your already taxed money, and and when you in factor all the taxes involved in in the buying process in the in the whole economy. So like, there's a lot of freaking taxes in, especially Austria, Germany, in the European countries. So, um. And you also described, uh, I saw it somewhere in an interview, I don't remember which one it was. You described Bitcoin also as the enemy of, uh, the, the money of enemies, which I loved completely. Uh, you, I think you basically described it as like, this is the money that even your enemies, uh, can have, which also, uh, I thought about that when you said like, oh, Larry Fink is, <laughs> uh, is, is working for you because a lot of people like see Larry Fink as, as this, Uh, evil person as the 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 person that is on the fiat system on the fiat side, but all of a sudden, um, even the enemies that adopt Bitcoin are working for you. I, I love that uh, analogy you what you you are giving. How how powerful is that of a technology when all of a sudden the incentives of everyone uh, is aligned? And 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 what do you think uh, will will that do to this this corrupt systems outside even uh, governments, maybe like big tech and, and all those systems. Yeah. So it's a very difficult thing to visualize and to kind of like wrap your head around because there's nothing to compare it to. But now there is. Let me give you an example. The country with the most popular president in the Americas, of course, I'm talking about El Salvador is the first country that made Bitcoin legal tender. They lowered the crime to the point that it's safer than a lot of American big cities. And they've respected private property rights. And Stacey Herbert is predicting that the GDP is going to 10x. And that was the first country that made Bitcoin legal tender. What happened? I don't think it's a coincidence that that country the first country that fixed the base layer of society. What do I mean by that? The, the computer that you're using right now, the microphone, right? The glasses that you have on your face, the shirt, you probably purchased that with money, right? So it's a core, it's a core function in the human condition, money, like the ability to transact with someone else without having to barter. Right. I don't need to tell you this. You're a Bitcoiner. That system is broken. It's corrupt. It's broken. Right. And because it's broken, it misaligns the incentive structure where if you're a politician in Brussels or Washington, D.C., you're not incentivized to do good by your constituents. You're incentivized to get as close as possible to the money printer because that's where you're going to get your money from. In El Salvador, it's really interesting. And it's a very unique situation as well. They don't have their own currency. They have the dollar. So because they can't just print it out of thin air, right? They're like, okay, I don't want to be heavily relying on the dollar. I'm going to be relying on Bitcoin. And then look at that. You're going to, you, you start to have good outcomes. 
what's really interesting is I could tell you what it's done for my life. All of a sudden, my life has improved. I bet you you've been on a Bitcoin stand. I don't know how many years, but I bet your life is is improving by the day. I've seen what it's done to my friends. I've seen what it's done to my family. I've seen what it's done to Michael Saylor, public company. Right. Every single time it's a country or an individual or an institution and they have adopted the Bitcoin standard, you don't change Bitcoin. Bitcoin changes you and all of a sudden things start working out. And why are things working out? Well, it's it's like pretty simple if you think about it. Imagine the thing that you're saving in is consistently losing value every single day of your life. So it's like you're running on a tread, like you're not moving forward. It's like you're putting all your energy and your time and your work into earning effing paper. And that paper is losing less and less purchasing power over time. Now you switch to Bitcoin and all of a sudden it's like, you purchase it's because of its absolute scarcity because you can't just print more of it out of thin air. All of a sudden, your purchasing power just increases over time. So all of a sudden, it, it doesn't even matter if you're at the bottom end of the economic spectrum. If you save in Bitcoin over time, you're able you're able to live a life of abundance, right? And the world has been living the exact opposite of that. Jeff Booth, I love the case that he's making, which is that society and the world should naturally be deflationary because of technology and because of the productivity gains that come from technology. But because of fiat and government intervention in money, they've coerced it into being an inflationary like situation. And they've psyoped the world, which is the craziest effing part. They've psyoped everyone into believing that somehow money has to lose purchasing power to work. That is insane. And, and you talk to your family about this. It's like, what is inflation? Why are the prices going up? And they're like, oh, Ukraine, the sub co Corona, the, the virus, the pandemic. And you're just, you're looking at them and you're like, you're like, I, I don't want to say you're crazy, but it's like, that's insane. And the reason that Bitcoin is so powerful is because it doesn't require democracy. It doesn't require a bunch of people to agree. You as an individual can start living on a sound money standard. And all of a sudden, even if the people around you just don't believe you, you're just like, all right, they don't believe me. Like my life is getting better. And this is the part where the beauty of Bitcoin is, is super fascinating. If you're a miner, you're not mining Bitcoin out of the goodness of your heart. If you're a Bitcoin node operator, you're not running that node because you just want to run that node. You're doing it as a miner. You're doing it for profit. As a node operator, you're doing it for uh, you're doing it because you don't want to trust someone else's chain. It's all out of self-interest. If you're a Bitcoin evangelist or content creator, it's like you love talking about Bitcoin, but I bet you you hold Bitcoin too, right? So it's like your incentives are aligned with mine. They're aligned with Sailor. They're aligned with the miners. They're aligned with Bukele. They're aligned with the node operators. They're aligned with Larry Fink. They're aligned... Every single person that is actively holding Bitcoin is now working for you. And this is what I mean. It's an aligned incentive structure system. And take a look at the countries or the institutions, the people or the families that have adopted it. It's always a great story. And now take a look at the societies that have gone down the route of fiat. It's always the same story. Nihilism, poverty, despair, inequality, war. Always, right? And I think it boils down to like a very fundamental reason. And I love to be inclusive in my messaging and I, I don't like to go down the spiritual route. But what, I'll, what I will say is, you know, in the Ten Commandments, one of the commandments is thou shall not steal. The money is based on theft, 
It's theft. It's stealing. You're stealing someone else's energy. It's not taxation. You can make, we and you can have a conversation about taxation, but to be fair, the social contract has been established. So people have agreed, okay, for whatever reason, I'm paying 50%. I, I don't know how they convince people of doing that, but it's been agreed upon. You see it come out of your account. You know, you see, you feel that you're paying those taxes. The evil of fiat and currency debasement is that the number in your bank account stays exactly the same. But what you can purchase with it goes lower. So it's very sinister and people aren't aware of it and governments take advantage of it. You've seen the videos of Christine Lagarde. It's like the problem with inflation is employers are hiring too much. People are spending too much money. You know, uh, we saw with Kamala recently, I will stop the companies from price gouging. <laughs> like it's insane. It, look, if we were in a free market and a market in a specific supermarket, they raise their prices. That would create an opportunity for all the other markets to say, oh, they're raising their price. We're going to lower our prices and we're going to take market share from them. The free market will take care of it. It's government intervention that has really screwed things up. And that's where Bitcoin comes in to save the day with an aligned incentive structure model where everybody wins and everybody can save and earn and hope for a better future rather than this nihilistic death machine that is fiat and central banking. Wow. I love the rambles a lot. Um, it's, it's really cool. One thing that uh, ca came to my mind also when when we're talking about community, when we talk about uh, all the things that a social media doing, is really interesting that you um, explain it as like social media and internet it kind of started that fire, and then now like Bitcoin is like uh, carrying the torch even uh, even further, uh, and it's uh, exactly against all those things that you just said with like. Uh, the, with like the, the salary and all those things um, is a, a fire against that. Um, one thing that came to my mind, sorry, um, is the salary, uh, the taxes in, in America, you have to pay that on out of your account, right? As if, you, if you're an employer, uh, employ, uh, employee, you have to pay that actually to the government directly. Or does yeah. the employer do, does that for you? Yeah. So the way that they did it and they, they actually, it was like kind of insidious, right? So um, if you're a W-2 employee, like if you're not a contractor, they will automatically deduct the tax, like your employer will deduct the taxes out of your check. And the way that they got away with that, and it, it always connects with war and fiat, it's always whatever. So the way that that was instituted in the United States is during World War II. And the excuse was, we need the extra money to pay for the bad, you know, pay for the war against the bad guys, right? When World War II ended, that system never went away. <laughs> it stayed, right? So that's essentially that keeps on happening. Like it, it, people have to understand that, like, it's not like one day, you know, we go from total freedom to the gulags. It happens little by little over time. So, you know, the establishment of the Federal Reserve, the way that they sold the American public was we're going to we're going to establish a central bank. It's going to make the economy more stable. We're not going to have any depressions. Mind you, the biggest depressions in American history have happened under central banking. 19, the 19, uh, the Great Depression, 19, uh, uh, early 1930s, late 1920s. And the Great Recession of 2008. So that was bullshit, okay? Number two, the same year that the Federal uh, Reserve was established in the United States, guess what? Was the same year that the federal income tax was established in the United States. You know what the first percentage was for the income tax? 3% for the highest earner. 3%. That's it. What happened over time? When FDR was president, the top income tax was 90%. So how do you go from 3% to 90%? Because the politicians say, no, 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 no. Don't worry. It's only 3%. When they get their foot in the door, they start to take more and more and more and more and more. That's essentially what's been happening. But you have to like figure out the root cause, 
the root what is the root cause like robin why are we having these problems why is the bureaucracy in the european union getting bigger why is the federal government getting bigger why do we have these endless wars it's very simple the bureaucrats have a unique ability of creating money for free that the rest of us have to work for what bitcoiners are advocating for is a system where no one has the godlike power of being able to create money for free that other human beings have to work for. If you want to make more Bitcoin, you have to mine it like everybody else, and there's a cost to it. You want to get more Bitcoin, you have to earn it, you have to buy it, or you have to mine it. There is no special person that has the ability to create Bitcoin at no cost to them. That is what is wrong fundamentally with the government, and fundamentally with a lot of the world's problems, say half the world's problems are caused by that root issue. If you fix that problem, a lot of these divisions that people feel will go away because it, it boils down to economics. Like you and I are both, I would say, very similar kind of generation. Do we have the same opportunities as our parents? Like, do we have the ability to buy a home or buy the thing or whatever? I don't even know if I didn't thank God I found Bitcoin, because if I didn't find Bitcoin, like I would be screwed like in five different ways. Right. So why is it that if the world is growing in productivity, the products are getting better, life is getting better, the technology is getting better. Why is it that we're getting poor? It's the money. The money's broken. Right. So this is what Bitcoin fixes. And the more we are able to highlight it using social media, the more attention we'll get to it. And really what we want is for people to ask a very basic question. If we get 80 percent or 50 percent or 40 percent of society to ask these two questions. Question number one, what is money? Question number two. Why does my money need to lose value for it to function? Politicians do not have a, you will see them turn white. You will see them say stuff like that question is a danger to democracy. That question is instability. You'll see them say anything and everything, but they will not answer the question. The reason they don't answer the question, they don't have an answer to the question. They don't have a good answer to the question. So yeah, man, it's a it's a very interesting, you know, moment in history we're living. Some people call it the fourth turning. Um, but our generation in the fourth turning, Robin, we are the hero generation. We are the generation that's supposed to make things right. The last time this happened in human history was during World War Two. Just to kind of give you an idea. We got a shit end of the stick. I, I got to got to be honest with you. We got a bad deck of cards. But it's our responsibility to do what we can with the situation that was presented to us and leave the world a better place in which we found it. Like we got to fix the shit that was put on to us so that our children and our children's children can be free. But at the same time, I think it's uh, an amazing time to be alive with the Internet revolution, with Bitcoin at the start. I think it's a it's amazing uh, time to be alive and to be to be young right now. But I 100 percent agree. Like uh, my uh, grandma had a lot of land. She could just uh, get to like she has six kids and she, she just uh, gifted each kid uh, land to build a home onto. Like she just had the land and she has plenty more uh so it's like uh the that that level of 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 like uh wealth it's so like if you compare it to this generation it's it's like not even close to it it's really interesting but we're coming closer to the end routine as we already over the one hour mark um i have always two questions the first question is always the same for every guest and the second is then from the previous guest um the first question for you that is always the same question what can we learn from you besides all the things that we already talked about on the podcast i would say don't lose like i would say you know you don't need a college education you don't need credentials you don't need special approval don't let society put you in a box in terms of what you can do and what you can't do 
all your dreams are 100% achievable. If you want to build a business, if you want to follow your heart, if you want to be a content creator, if you want to whatever and you want to make money out of it and you want to succeed, it is 1 million percent possible. The only question that the universe will continue to ask you, especially in the beginning, where you will have no market feedback telling you that you're doing something right. The universe is always just going to ask you, how much do you want it? And if you continue to say, I want it and I want it and you show up every single day and you suffer and you go through the mud and you crawl and you and you get betrayed and you get back up and you just keep fighting and you keep fighting and you keep fighting. Eventually, you will succeed at whatever it is that you're trying to succeed. That's the message that I wish was told to me. I think it was by certain people. I just didn't fully appreciate how sincere they were when they told me that. But, you know, follow your dreams. If your dreams are very high, expect to suffer and have to work like nobody else around you. But if you do that, you can achieve anything that you put your your mind to. Uh, That's what I would say. Especially on Bitcoin. Bitcoin's a fucking cheat code. Like maybe not on fiat. But on Bitcoin, for sure, like it just makes everything so much easier. Uh, that, that, that's for sure. Um, really cool. Uh, now coming to the end routine where the previous guest is asking a question for the next guest without knowing who the next guest actually is. Um, and your question from the previous guest uh, is an interesting one. What is the last thing you learned about Bitcoin and why did it stuck in your head? Wow. So the Bitcoin rabbit hole is extremely, it, it's never ending. And I always have these, uh, these, uh, these realizations, um, like the deeper and deeper and deeper you go down. And one of the realizations I have lately, we, we just spent a good amount of time. I actually tweeted it out yesterday and it's basically like, look, um, uh, the money of communism is central bank digital currencies. The money of Bitcoin, the money of capitalism is Bitcoin. Um, if you see it from that worldview, everything around you makes sense. Like in terms of what certain political parties are doing in turn, certain what's happening in your country, if you see it from that perspective. So that's where I'm at in the rabbit hole. Perhaps it's because of the election. Perhaps it's because of the fact that they locked the samurai wallet guys in jail. Perhaps it's because they've been attacking self-custody. Perhaps it's because they've been attacking the mining industry. I mean, even in Europe and Norway, like so much energy (laughs) up north and they're like, let's ban Bitcoin mining. You're just like, what the F? Look at it from that lens. Capitalism, you want capitalism in your future. You want a free, you want a free market society. Bitcoin is the only currency that will facilitate that. If you want a totalitarian collectivist communist slash fascist society, CBDC is the only money that's going to enable that type of society. That's one of the latest things I've learned down going down the Bitcoin rabbit hole. And I'm glad I got to talk about it today with you. 100% agreed. Um, I appreciate uh, you coming on. I appreciate your time also. Before I let you go, where can people find you, ask your questions, see the things that you create? Yeah, so you guys could follow me on Twitter at Bitvolt, and uh, you know we I'm I'm founder of Simply Bitcoin. Uh, we're a media company, and we release a, a bunch of content. So you can follow at the Simply Bitcoin handle on Twitter. You'll find us everywhere. You can find us on Rumble. You can find us on YouTube. Um, my show on Simply Bitcoin. We have a bunch of different content, but my personal show is the Simply Bitcoin Live, the original show. Uh, and we go live Monday through Friday at 12.15 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Thank you so much for being on. Thank you also for everyone watching and listening for joining us today. As always, I'll be back tomorrow with another episode. Bye-bye.